<clears throat> it's great to be here, and it's great to be a pop star with my Britney Spears mic. So, um, <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm Mike Solomon, um, and today we're talking about transpiling GraphQL instead of writing customized server code. So before I jump in, I just want to clear up the meaning of transpiling. Uh, transpiling just means that we're taking some source code. In this case, it'll be a GraphQL query, and we're going to translate it into some different source code. Today, that'll be kind of JavaScript-flavored pseudocode. A little bit of background about me. I work on a team at Twitter that builds kind of like a data access layer as a service that we use to power our GraphQL implementation. And you can follow me at MSOL on Twitter. All right, first a quick agenda so you know what to expect. So today, we'll recap some properties of GraphQL that are relevant for transpiling and introduce an example. And we'll talk about how GraphQL implementations typically work and which parts a developer has to implement. And lastly, we'll talk about how we might be able to skip doing all of that in favor of letting the computer do it for us. All right, what not how. So now that you're trapped here, my real purpose is to get some engagement on my tweets. So if you go to this URL, and you should, you'll see something kind of like this. It's a series of tweets. Each one's a vain attempt at humor. And all of these tweets belong to a user. That's me. And we call this all together the user timeline. User timeline is made up of tweets. So pretty straightforward. We've got a user. That user has a user timeline. And a user timeline is made up of tweets. One, two, one, two. Seems pretty straightforward. So let's move on and see how we might model this in GraphQL by looking at a really simplified schema definition. So here's our schema. We'll look at the whole thing at once. We've got a query. Um, this is GraphQL's top level query object. We can ask for a user by ID, and we'll get back a user. Crazy. Um, looking at the user itself, um, we've really trimmed down our user. All we're going to get back is that same ID and also a timeline. Um, this timeline is a list. It's a list of tweets, um, just like we talked about before. And tweets are also really um, slimmed down. So we just have an ID field and a text string. So we're not actually going to be able to see or build that whole view from the last slide where there's like some uh, you know, pictures of me and uh, maybe some engagement counts and stuff. We'll just get the text, but I think that um, that'll be pretty good for illustrating. OK, let's look at an actual query demonstrating how we might get this um, get data to build that uh, in GraphQL. So here's a query, very creative, so we named it user timeline. It takes a single argument, the user ID. We're going to take that user ID and pass it to the user field. We're going to get back a timeline. And for every tweet in that timeline, we're going to get back some text, probably exactly what you expected. So let's look at this a little bit. You can see that here there's lots of what. We're getting a user. We're getting a timeline. We're getting text. But nowhere here is there anything that says how we're getting it. And this is a really good thing. It means that uh, client developers don't need to worry about where the data is actually coming from. The, those are just implementation details. So that's all hidden. And that's great. All right, let's belabor this point just a little bit more with a diagram. And this time, we'll focus on where the data comes from. So we'll start with a user ID. And we're going to use that to get the user from the database. So given a user ID, we can get a user. Once we have a user, we can look up that user's timeline, um, perhaps in a database. And they'll have one timeline. Once we have that timeline, um, we can look up tweets. And there will be a whole bunch of tweets making up that timeline. Uh, these will be items in a database somewhere. And now that we have a list of tweet objects, each one of those objects um, has some fields. And one of those fields is text. And that's the one that we actually want to pull off. So there's probably more data available here in our graph. But this is the only part of the data graph that we're actually concerned about for this query. So we're going to keep it just laser focused on that. All right. Let's talk about how GraphQL implementations typically work. Um, if you have a GraphQL service, the odds are pretty good that you wrote some code to actually go and fetch some data. So let's go over what function we might implement for each field in our query. Uh, these are typically called resolvers. 
And we'll look at examples in something that sort of resembles JavaScript, and we're going to assume that we're working in some GraphQL framework. So let's start by writing a resolver for the user field in our GraphQL's uh, uh, top-level query object. So you can see here we have three args. There's the parent value, that's query. Maybe not anything interesting in that right now. Um, we have some arguments, like field arguments, like that user ID. And we have a request context. This often has things like the logged in user and maybe access to some databases. So let's look at the implementation. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. We're just going to look in our context, access the database, the user database. And by ID, we'll look up a user using the argument that we got in the arguments. Pretty straightforward. We also have a couple more of these that do similar things. So you can see that for timelines, we use the user ID to look up a timeline in a different database. And this one contains the timeline and tweet objects. And then for the text field, we can just pull it off of the parent object, which is just a tweet. So these first two resolvers look pretty similar. Um, they just look up some data in a database, whereas the third one um, doesn't even need to look up anything in a database. It can just pull it off of the parent object. All right, so where where does that data actually come from? So now that you've seen how we might implement those resolvers by hand, we'll um, review them real quickly. Where does the data for this actually come from? So here it comes from a database. And here it comes from a different database, or maybe a different table in the same database. Not important. And here it was just a field on the tweet object. So some of this knowledge about where data comes from is baked into the resolvers. But it doesn't have to be. Instead, we can put it in the schema. The schema already tells us lots of information. For example, it tells us types. Uh, we know whether something's a union or a list or an object and so forth. Um, it also tells us about graph connections. So uh, in our schema, it's always going to be by type and ID. So for example, uh, we might have a user ID. Uh, so we can look up users using that ID. And if we need extra information, we can use field arguments to pass it. We're, we're not really going to look at many examples of that today, but um, that's always there if we need it. Now, we can also enrich the schema with any extra information we might need. Um, in particular, we might need to know how to call a database or a service, um, basically everything that's circled right now. We might need that information in the schema. It's not normally there, so we can uh, enrich our schema with that. And uh, we might already have an existing data access layer that we can use as the source for that. OK, so now that we've seen how GraphQL implementations typically work, let's see if there's anything that we can improve upon. So we're using GraphQL to make life easier for developers. So we want it to be trivial to add new data in our GraphQL API. So one observation is that the resolver code seems a little bit repetitive. Often we're just looking something up in a database, or maybe we're pulling um, some data off of a different object that we already have in memory. So maybe we can avoid writing it at all. Um, seems like there might be an opportunity here. Uh, we've also found that teams can have more independence if business logic doesn't live in the API layer. So resolvers are a really tempting place to put this logic, since they're just little functions, and uh, you can write whatever you want in there. All right, also, API updates um, typically require deploys. Now, deploys aren't always a big deal, but they do represent an organizational dependency between teams. Um, often, one team might run a GraphQL service, and other teams own the underlying data. So maybe we can give those teams more independence if we don't require the GraphQL service to deploy whenever they want to add new data to the GraphQL API. Lastly, we'd like to automatically apply good ideas everywhere. So things like error handling, access control, and any sort of improvement that we might dream up can get applied everywhere, and users don't have to do any extra work when they're just wanting to expose new data through the GraphQL API. And that leads us to an idea. Maybe we can generate most of our implementations instead of actually writing them. So instead of writing resolvers for each field, as we normally would, we can take a query that we get and transform that into a specialized function with enough logic to fulfill that query. So one observation here is that most queries are reused many times. So maybe this isn't a crazy expensive thing to do. Um, they'll see lots of reuse. Uh, this means that there will be no handwritten resolvers, which addresses a lot of the um, potential issues we talked about before. Uh, 
Um, and it's also very automatic. It's very little work to add new data to our schema, because most of the work is done for you, uh, all, hopefully all of the repetitive parts. And we can apply our good ideas everywhere, because we can just generate them into uh, our generated code. All right. So here's the same query for the user timeline that we saw before. We're going to go through this line by line and see how we can generate code for it, as if we were a transpiler. The code that we generate will look something like pseudo JavaScript. And remember that everything hereafter isn't code that we'll be writing by hand. We're going to see how we can automatically transpile GraphQL queries to functions without human involvement. OK, well, let's just jump in at the very top. So a query, like our user timeline query, uh, it takes a user ID argument, and it has a body that we're ignoring at the moment, which is what that three dot ellipsis is for. So a query becomes a function. We might name our function something like get user timeline, because we're very creative. Um, it'll still take that same user ID argument, and it will have some body that we're not going to focus on at the moment. OK, so I think maybe that's a little hard to follow, but it'll be easier if we can see our original query and our generated code side by side. So let's do that. All right, so we have our query, user timeline, takes one argument, and that generates our function get user timeline, also takes one argument. We also have the rest of the query still left to fill in on the left, and we have some corresponding code to generate, as well as a return value that we haven't generated yet either. OK, let's move on. So objects that are looked up by ID, and we have one of these, user, we look it up by the user ID. These generally call out to a database or some, maybe another service, some kind of data source. We'll just say database. So that might look something like this. We just say user equals database.user. Maybe this looks things up in the user table. And by the user ID, we're going to look up that user and get some object back. OK, let's look at that in context. We're going to ask for the user by ID. And in the function, we'll get the user from the database. So we still aren't worrying about the rest of the query. And over here, we, uh, we start to build out a value to return. So we know that we have to return a user. So we're going to name it, because we're creative, user. OK, now things are going to get a little bit more interesting. So graph connections, like timeline, and you might remember from our diagram earlier, users each have a user timeline. So this is a graph connection. So graph connections use schema information to call out to the database. So that might look something like this. Timeline, we look up the timeline table in our database by user ID. Uh, use the user from before in its ID. And in order to generate this line, we had to know that users have timelines. And we actually do know that because of how the schema is structured. It tells us about our graph connections. So that's wh how we're able to get this information. We're actually not done with timelines yet, so um, we'll, we'll get to the code in a second, because timelines are actually lists of tweets. So we have to handle the list as well. So timeline is a list of tweets. And lists, we need to iterate over all of the results. So we might do something like this. Uh, on the timeline object that we got before, we looked it up in the database, we're going to map over it and handle every tweet separately. OK, now let's look at both of these pieces side by side again. We're focused on the timeline. And we use the schema's graph information to know that we need to, uh, or to look up the user's timeline in the database. And then we can use type information from the schema to know that we need to iterate over every item in that timeline. That's all we want to focus on on the query. But now we know that the value we're returning has a timeline nested inside the user, and also that the value of that timeline is the result of iterating over the timeline. So now we've actually built out most of our final return value, although we don't actually know what uh, the value of tweets looks like fully yet. OK, this last one's easy. Field access on objects, like text, where we're just looking at the text field on a tweet, remains field access on objects. So we just say text is tweet.text. Very straightforward. OK, so now uh, we look up the text field, and we can actually see the whole GraphQL query that we were trying to generate code for there on the left. And we're returning the same 
Oh, sorry. Um, in context, it's easy to see that we just pull the text field from the tweet out so that we can return it. So we can say text is tweet.text and return an object. And remember that we're still returning the same overall value from before. We now have our original query on the left and our generated function on the right. So this function is only used for this query and for no others, but no one actually had to write this code. You can see that it at least somewhat resembles what kind of code you might write here by hand. Uh, user, timeline, text, all in roughly the same order. In some sense, this query, uh, the function, it, sorry, in some sense, the query is the declarative version of the procedural implementation on the right. They correspond to each other pretty closely. All right, so now we've seen how we can automatically generate implementations for our queries. So let's go back and see how we did on our goals. So what does this enable for us? Well, we've made it possible for us to build a system with easy opt-in to GraphQL for data sets. We haven't actually built that whole system here today, but we've opened the door. We eliminated the need for developers to make changes in the API layer by hand, um, so building such a system will be a lot easier. Also, remember that we can use a data access layer that tells us where uh, data in the graph lives, so it's easy to augment the schema and wire up new connections dynamically. There's also no business logic now in the API layer. You actually can't write any into resolvers because you don't write resolvers. And we can, this will make it much easier to add new data to GraphQL without deploys, again, because developers don't need to write any resolvers. And furthermore, it gives us a good place to generically apply a few things. We can handle errors we can, by generating error handling logic in all the queries, so it's easy to see how it works, and we can't forget to do it. For access control, it's pretty similar. We can't forget about access control because um, it's generated into the queries, assuming we have a good data source for these kinds of things. Um, we can also do batching. It might not be obvious from the examples, but we can actually generate code that handles batches of requests. So for example, if you wanted to look up a whole list of tweets, you can ask for them in a single request instead of many. So you can avoid like the n plus one problem, for example. And it's also easy to add operational improvements generically in this model. So what's next? Well, because each query becomes a different function, we have lots of information about what each query is going to do. So that makes it kind of a good candidate for optimization. So that's one potential direction we could go next. Also, this approach extends naturally to both mutations and subscriptions. So uh, those are things I think we hope to handle soon. All right, so I definitely glossed over a lot in this talk. And as you might guess, this isn't exactly what we do. And there are other ways to approach a lot of these problems. Um, so I'd love to talk about those with you during our next break if you find me somewhere out there. Again, I'm Mike Solomon. You can follow me if you like tweets. I'm at MSol on Twitter. Um, our team's hiring, and so is the rest of Twitter. And thanks for listening. <laughs>